This is the Sabbath School lesson for the third quarter, 2020. Lesson 5 for July 25 to 31, ready for teaching on the 1st of August. Spirit Empowered Witnessing, read by Dr. Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, July 25. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we really thank you for your word, the Bible, and what it shows us, what it shows us about you, what it shows us about salvation. And we thank you for that salvation. We thank you for the grace that comes from you. We thank you for the grace that is shown through the life and death and resurrection of Jesus and that he's coming again for us. And this week we have the opportunity of learning more about how we can Share that grace and that love with those around us. We pray that your Holy Spirit will guide us and that we may be attentive to the working of the Holy Spirit in our lives, that we may be able to show others that not only do you love them, but that you want them to be part of your life and for you to be part of their life too. We pray in Jesus' dear name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Acts chapter 4 and verse 31. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. Let's read that again, Acts chapter 4 and verse 31. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. When Jesus commanded the early believers to go into all the world and preach the gospel, it must have seemed like an impossible mission. That was from Mark 16, verse 15, that he said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. How could they ever accomplish such a huge challenge? Their numbers were so small. Their resources were limited. They were a largely uneducated band of ordinary believers. But they had an extraordinary God who would empower them for their extraordinary mission. But Jesus declared in Acts 1 verse 8, You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. The empowering of the Holy Spirit could enable the believers to share the message of the cross with life-changing, world-changing power. The Holy Spirit made their witness effective. In a few short decades, the gospel impacted the entire world. Acts declares that these early believers turned the world upside down. I'd like to read the whole verse there, Acts 17, verse 6. And when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some brethren to the rulers of the city, crying out, These who have turned the world upside down have come here too. The Apostle Paul adds that the gospel was preached to every creature under heaven in Colossians 1, 23. In this week's lesson, we will especially focus on the role of the Holy Spirit in empowering our witness for Christ. Sunday, July 26. Jesus and the Promise of the Holy Spirit With the promise of the Holy Spirit, Jesus met the disciples' concern about his leaving them and returning to heaven. As he said in John 16, verse 7, It is to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you, but if I depart, I will send him to you. The Greek word for helper is parakletos. It refers to one who comes alongside of, for the purpose of helping. One of the prime functions of the Holy Spirit is to come alongside of all believers to empower and guide them in their witnessing activities. When we witness for Jesus, we are not alone. 
The Holy Spirit is beside us to guide us to those honest-hearted seekers. He prepares their hearts before we ever meet them. He guides our words, brings conviction to the seekers' minds, and strengthens them to respond to his promptings. Question. Read John fifteen twenty six and 27 and John 16, verse 8. What do these verses tell us about the Holy Spirit's role in witnessing? John 15, beginning at verse 26, But when the Helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me, and you also will bear witness, because you have been with me from the beginning. And John 16, verse 8. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin, and of righteousness, and of judgment. The Holy Spirit testifies or witnesses of Jesus. His ultimate goal is to lead as many people to Jesus as possible. His mission is to glorify Jesus. In this role... He convicts all believers of their responsibility to witness. He opens our eyes to see the possibilities in people all around us and works behind the scenes to create a receptivity to the Gospel message. The Gospel of John states it clearly in chapter 16, verse 8. He will convict the world of sin. In other words, he moves upon hearts to bring a deepening sense of alienation from God and the need of repentance. He also convicts the world of righteousness. Not only does the Holy Spirit reveal sin, but he also instructs us in righteousness. He reveals the magnificence of Jesus' righteousness in contrast to our own filthiness. The Holy Spirit's role is not merely to point out how bad we are. It is to reveal how good, how kind, how compassionate and how loving Jesus is and to mould us into his image. Witnessing is simply cooperating with the Holy Spirit to glorify Jesus. In the Spirit's power and under his guidance, we testify of this amazing Christ who has transformed our lives. So, to finish today, in our desire to work for souls, why must we always remember that only the Holy Spirit, not us, can do the converting? Monday, July 27, An Empowered Church The Book of Acts rightly has been called the Acts of the Holy Spirit. It is an exciting adventure in witnessing evangelistic proclamation and church growth. Acts is the story of consecrated believers filled with the Holy Spirit, impacting the world for Christ. They were totally dependent on the Holy Spirit to accomplish miraculous results. Theirs is an example of what the Holy Spirit can accomplish through men and women who are totally consecrated to Him. Question. Read Acts chapter 2, verse 41 and 42, Acts 4, verse 4 and 31, Acts 5, verse 14 and 42, Acts 6, verse 7, and Acts 16, verse 5. What impresses you most about these passages? What is the message that Luke, the author of Acts, desires to share by recording such rapid growth? Acts 2, verses 40 and 41. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about three thousand souls were added to them, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread, and in prayers. And Acts chapter 4, verse 4, However, many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to be about 5,000. And verse 31, And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God 
with boldness, and Acts chapter 5, verse 14. And believers were increasingly added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women. And verse 42. And daily in the temple and in every house they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. And Acts 6, verse 7. Then the word of God spread, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. And Acts chapter 16, verse 5. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and increased in number daily. Luke's intent in writing the book of Acts is to share with each reader the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the early church. Notice too that he is not hesitant to use numbers to measure the movement of the Spirit in the first century. That is, he was counting baptisms. In Acts 2.41, he highlights the fact that 3,000 were baptized in a single day at a single place. In Acts 4, verse 4, he speaks of 5,000 men who were baptized. In Acts 5, verse 14, multitudes come to the Lord and are baptized. Whether it is a single individual, such as Lydia, the Philippian jailer, a demon-possessed slave girl, or the Ethiopian eunuch, Luke takes notice and records the moving of the Holy Spirit in the hearts of these people. The important point here is that behind each of the large numbers are individual human beings, each one a child of God for whom Jesus Christ died. Yes, we like the big numbers, but in the end, witnessing is often a one-to-one endeavour. To facilitate the rapid growth of the New Testament church, new churches were planted. One of the reasons that the early church grew so rapidly is because the church was constantly renewed through planting new churches. What an important message for us today. And so to finish the day, the prime focus of the New Testament church was mission. How can we make sure that at this core of all that we do in our local church, mission is always at the centre? Tuesday, July 28, The Holy Spirit and Witnessing Throughout the book of Acts, the Holy Spirit was powerfully present. He ministered to and through the believers as they witnessed for their Lord in a variety of ways. He strengthened them to face the trials and challenges of witnessing in a hostile culture. He led them to honest-hearted truth-seekers. He prepared the hearts of people in whole cities before the believers even came to those cities. He opened doors to opportunity that they never dreamed of and empowered their words and actions. Question, read Acts 7.55, 8.29, 11.15, 15.28 and 29, and 16.6-10. How did the Holy Spirit minister to the witnessing disciples in each of the experiences listed in these Bible verses? In other words, what were some of the various things the Holy Spirit did in these situations? Acts 7, 55. But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Acts eight twenty nine. Then the Spirit said to Philip, Go near and overtake this chariot. And Acts eleven fifteen. And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them as upon us at the beginning. Acts fifteen twenty eight and 29, For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things, that you abstain from things offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled, and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourselves from these, you will do well. Farewell. 
Acts 16, verses 6 to 10. Now, when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the gospel in Asia. After they had come to Mysia, they tried to go to Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. So, passing by Mysia, they came down to Troas. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. Now, after he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. The Holy Spirit's varied ministry in the first century was truly amazing. The experiences above are just a sampling of his activity. He strengthened Stephen to witness for his Lord in the face of a ruthless and out-of-control mob stoning him to death. He miraculously guided Philip to an influential, truth-seeking Ethiopian to open up the continent of Africa for the gospel. He gave Peter a confirmatory sign when the Gentile believers also received the gift of the Holy Spirit. He brought the church together in unity at a time when it could easily have split over the issue of circumcision. And he opened up the entire continent of Europe to the preaching of the gospel through the Apostle Paul. The Holy Spirit was active in the New Testament church and is active in the life of the church today. He longs to empower us, strengthen us, teach us, guide us, unify us, and send us out on the most important mission in the world, which is leading men and women to Jesus and his truth. The point we have to remember is that he is still active and working today, just as he was in the time of the apostles and the early church. So, to finish the day, what can we do, day by day, to make ourselves more open and amenable to the power of the Holy Spirit in our own lives? What are the right kinds of choices that will enable him to work in and through us? Wednesday, July 29. The Holy Spirit, the Word, and Witnessing. The Word of God was at the very heart of the witness of the New Testament Church. Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost drew largely from the Old Testament to prove that Christ was the Messiah. Stephen's dying testimony reviewed Israel's history in the Old Testament. Peter referred to the word which God sent to the children of Israel in Acts 10.36, and then shared the resurrection story with Cornelius. The Apostle Paul referred again and again to the great Old Testament predictions regarding the coming of the Messiah, and Philip carefully explained to a seeking Ethiopian the significance of the messianic prediction in Isaiah chapter 53. In each instance, the disciples proclaimed God's word, not their own. The Spirit-inspired word was the basis of their authority. Question. Read Acts chapter 4, verses 4 and 31, Acts 8, verse 4, Acts 13, verses 48 and 49, Acts 17, 2, and Acts 18, 24 and 25. What do these passages teach us about the relationship between the Holy Spirit, the Word of God, and the witness of the New Testament Church? Let's read those texts. Acts 4. Verse 4, however, many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to be about 5,000. And verse 31, and when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. And Acts 8, verse 4, therefore those who were scattered went everywhere 
preaching the word. And Acts 13, beginning at verse 48, Now when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord, and as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was being spread throughout all the region. And Acts 17, verse 2, Then Paul, as his custom was, went into them, and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the Scriptures. And Acts 18, beginning at verse 24, Now a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the Scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord, though he knew only the baptism of John. The same Holy Spirit, who inspired the Word of God, works through the Word to change lives. There is life-giving power in the Word of God because through the Spirit it is Christ's living Word. Question. Read Second Peter chapter 1, verse 21 and Hebrews 4, verse 12. Why is the Word of God so powerful in changing lives? Second Peter one twenty one for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And Hebrews four twelve for the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Ellen White writes in Education, page 126, The creative energy that called the worlds into existence is in the Word of God. This Word imparts power. It begets life. Every command is a promise. Accepted by the will, received by the soul, it brings with it the life of the Infinite One. It transforms the nature and recreates the soul in the image of God. End of quote. The reason the Bible has such power to transform lives is because the same Holy Spirit who inspired the Bible in the first place inspires and changes us as we read it. As we share God's Word with others, the Holy Spirit works to change their lives through the Word He inspired. God has promised to bless His Word, not our words. The power is in the Word of God, not human speculation. Thursday, July 30. The Life-Transforming Power of the Holy Spirit A careful study of the Book of Acts reveals God, through His Spirit, working miracles in human lives. Acts is a case study of the Gospels triumphing over cultural biases, transforming lifelong, deeply ingrained habits, and teaching all humanity Christ's grace and truth. The Holy Spirit meets people where they are, but He does not leave them there. In His presence they are changed, their lives are transformed. Question, read Acts 16, verses 11 to 15 and 23 to 34, Acts 17, 33 and 34, and Acts 18, verse 8. These are just a few of the conversion stories in the Bible. What do the various accounts teach us about the power of God to change the lives of all sorts of people from various backgrounds? Acts 16, beginning at verse 11. Therefore, sailing from Troas, we ran a straight course to Samothrace, and the next day came to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is the foremost city of that part of Macedonia, a colony. And we were staying in that city for some days. And on the Sabbath day, we went out of the city to the riverside, where prayer was customarily made. And we sat down and spoke to the women who met there. Now a certain woman named Lydia heard us. She was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira, who worshipped God. 
The Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul, and, when she and her household were baptised, she begged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. So she persuaded us. And Acts 16, verses 23 to 34. And when they had laid many stripes on them, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. Having received such a charge, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's chains were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awaking from sleep and seeing the prison doors opened, supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. But Paul called with a loud voice, saying, Do yourself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light, ran in, and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. And he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? So they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes. And immediately he and all his family were baptized. Now, when he had brought them into his house, he set food before them. And he rejoiced, having believed in God with all his household. And Acts 17, beginning at verse 33, So Paul departed from among them. However, some men joined him and believed, among them Dionysius the Areopagite, a woman named Damaris, and others with them. And Acts 18, verse 8, Then Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his household, and many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed, and were baptised. What an amazing variety of people. Lydia was a prosperous Jewish businesswoman, and the Philippian jailer was a middle-class Roman civil servant. The Holy Spirit can reach all spectrums of society. His power to transform reaches both men and women, rich and poor, educated and uneducated. The last two characters on our list are equally as remarkable. Acts 17.34 refers to the conversion of Dionysius the Areopagite. In Bible times, the Athenian Areopagites were part of the legal council of judges who tried court cases. They were prominent, well-respected members of Greek society. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, the ministry of the Apostle Paul reached even the upper echelon of society. Crispus, in Acts 18, verse 8, was a ruler of the Jewish synagogue. He was a religious leader steeped in Jewish Old Testament thought, and the Holy Spirit broke through and changed his life. These case histories reveal that as we witness for Christ and share his word with others, the Holy Spirit will do remarkable things in the lives of all sorts of people from all sorts of backgrounds, cultures, education, and beliefs. We cannot and must not make assumptions about who can or cannot be reached. Our job is to witness to anyone and everyone brought into our lives. The Lord will do the rest. And so to finish today, Christ's death was universal, that is, it was for every human being, ever. What should this crucial truth teach us about how we should never assume that anyone is beyond the hope of salvation? Friday, July 31. The Holy Spirit cooperates with the Father and the Son in the redemptive process. In all of our witnessing activities, we are joining Him in His work of saving people. 
He convicts hearts, he opens doors of opportunity. Through his word he enlightens minds and reveals truth. He breaks the bonds of prejudice that enslave us, triumphs over cultural biases that obscure our vision of truth, and delivers us from the chains of evil habits that shackle us. As we witness for Jesus, it is crucial to remember that we are cooperating with the Holy Spirit. He is there before us, preparing hearts to receive the message of the gospel. He is there with us, moving upon minds as we perform an act of random kindness, share our testimony, conduct a Bible study, give away a piece of truthful literature, or participate in an evangelistic outreach. He will continue working upon the heart of the individual long after we leave, doing whatever it takes to lead that person to a knowledge of salvation. And that brings us to four discussion questions for this week. 1. Share with the members of your Sabbath school group a time when you sensed the Holy Spirit's working powerfully through your witness. 2. Have you ever felt apprehensive or fearful about sharing your faith? How does a knowledge of the ministry of the Holy Spirit reduce that fear and give you assurance as you witness? 3. In this week's lesson, we talked about the activity of the Holy Spirit in our witnessing. Discuss some different ways the Holy Spirit works with us in our witnessing endeavours. How does the Holy Spirit equip us to witness and work in the lives of others as we witness? And 4. The lesson talked about the centrality of the Bible in witnessing. Why is the Bible such a crucial component of our faith and witness? How can we avoid the traps of those who, even while claiming to believe in the Bible, subtly diminish its authority and witness? Inside Story. Our mission story this week is titled Four Dreams in a Row, and it's by Andrew McChesney of Adventist Mission. The first dream occurred after Abraham Kieta got up at 3 a.m. for customary prayers on his prayer mat in Bufa, a village in Guinea in West Africa. I am more than 40. And I don't have a wife or children or work or money, Abraham prayed. Please help me. I want you to turn me into a prophet who can talk to other people through you. As he prayed, a wind began to blow. He felt weak and fell asleep on the mat. Suddenly someone nudged him and said, My son, go inside and sleep in your bed. Minutes later he was sleeping in his bed and he had a dream. In the dream, someone with eyes that looked like fire approached him. Abraham thought he was about to be attacked. Terrified, Abraham asked, Who are you? I am Jesus Christ, the man said. In the morning, Abraham wondered what would happen next. The next night, he had another dream. He saw the man again. This time, the two walked along the trail of a tall mountain. On the third night, Abraham dreamed that he was looking for work, and Jesus was hiring workers. Abraham saw Jesus sitting at a table, taking people's names and writing them down. On the fourth night, Abraham saw Jesus chest deep in the waters of the Atlantic Ocean. Jesus looked at him, and he looked at Jesus. Three years passed. Abraham moved to Guinea's capital, Conakry, and was hired as a construction worker. Walking home from work, he met a global mission pioneer, Twankol Fasinadomo, on the road. How are you? Twankol asked. I'm a Christian. Would you like to visit my church? How can I? Abraham replied. I belong to another religion. I don't even understand what you are talking about. At home, however, he remembered his dreams about Jesus. He decided to go to the global mission pioneer's church to see what it was about. At the church he was welcomed warmly, and he liked what he heard. He returned every Sabbath after that, and gave his heart to Jesus. 
Today, Abraham Keita, aged 48, is the watchman for the headquarters of the Seventh-day Adventist Church in Guinea and custodian for the adjacent school. Part of this quarter's 13th Sabbath offering will help expand an affiliated school in Conakry. My dreams led me to Jesus, Abraham said. I am walking with him now, just like in one of my dreams. I am on a journey with Jesus. And there's a lovely photo of Conakry to our left here, um, with an open neck shirt and he's wearing spectacles and a very short haircut, but a lovely smile. This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind and Hearing Impaired, Christian Record Services for the Blind, the Sabbath School Department and Hope Channel. You can also listen on the official Sabbath School 4 app and the Apple iTunes app, Sabbath School with Percy Harold. Remember, God is always faithful.